Thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, the title of my talk is Giving and Happiness, and most of the research on it is done by a gentleman named Andreas Morgensen, who is now a professor in philosophy at Oxford University. Uh, most of the information will be psychology and economics, so stuff that he kind of researched out of his field. So um, I hope you guys enjoy the sort of spread of information I'll be giving you. Uh, so what is the relationship between giving and happiness? And the way of structuring this question, I think, or at least for the purpose of this talk, is to consider how much uh, all of you in this audience can afford to give. Um, I'm gonna assume that most of you are students and so you probably don't have all that much money right now, um, but you will one day. Uh, the average uh, UK graduate earns just about 22,000 pounds per year, um, and that's in their first year, and from there the trend is to go up and up all the way until when you retire. So you don't have any money now, but you will in the future, and so it's worth thinking about, like what are you gonna do um, with all of that money. So great news, you're gonna have lots of money, what are you gonna do with it? Well, I'm gonna assume that at least some of it is probably already spoken for, so you're probably gonna to wanna to like do things like buy groceries, or like own a house, or get married, um, maybe have a kid, maybe go on vacation, maybe go on vacation again, uh, and probably you're gonna to wanna to save for retirement or something like that, I'm told that's, that's important as well. Um, but suppose you also wanna take seriously the idea that you could do an incredible amount of good for the world by donating to the very best causes, and, Ideally, the causes that giving what we can identifies as the most effective. So how much could you afford to give? How much could you give without losing your mind? Well, like 90% seems a bit steep, uh, unless you turn out to be incredibly wealthy. Maybe you get lucky, maybe you earn a million pounds and actually 90% you still got 100,000 pounds left. That's pretty good. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, we're not gonna do anything too dramatic. We're gonna consider something that sounds dramatic, but is much more reasonable, something like 10%. So what would it be like? What would it actually be like to give away 10%? Would you notice? Would it make you unhappy? Would it make you happier, perhaps? Well, I'm gonna argue for two major conclusions uh, in this presentation. The first is that um, even under the worst case scenario, even under the sort of most pessimistic assumptions, you actually wouldn't be significantly worse off by giving away 10%. Um, by giving away 10% to these effective causes, you would effectively be saving dozens of people's lives. Uh, and in the process, you could only be slightly uh, less satisfied than you would be. This is what seems to be what the evidence suggests. But the evidence actually suggests another possibility, which is that giving away something substantial like 10% might actually make you happier. Um, and the core reason behind this is that doing good feels good, and this is actually corroborated by a number of different sources. All right, so over the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on uh, questions of, by social psychologists and economists that look at uh, studies of how, how different uh, activities Cause, uh, cause us to be happy or unhappy. Um, and so I think before actually going into that data, before actually talking about uh, what that data shows us, I'm gonna try and address some methodological worries you might have about these ideas. So uh, many people have sort of different preconceptions about what makes us happy. Some people think, uh, you know, life in modern Britain is incredibly expensive and so we need lots of money to be happy. Other people maybe are a little bit more idealistic they think once you have the basics, necessities covered, uh, really the things that make you happy are things like friendship and like family and stuff like that. Um, but for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing, as I said, mostly on social psychology and economics data. And the, and the information that we get out of that are basically by focusing on um, well-being life satisfaction surveys. So in essence, what, what these are is essentially you uh, ask people how happy they are at different points in their life. So after, an, uh, after a certain event in their life, you ask them how happy they are and see the effect of that event. Um, you ask people how happy they are when they're in certain income brackets. And by comparing all this information, we see general trends of, ha of happiness um, and different uh, situations. So as I said before, going too much into what this data says, I wanna try and address some potential worries you might have about using this data set. Uh, the first worry you might have is that uh, people's self-reports about how happy they are are kind of affected by random arbitrary phenomena. So uh, if the weather is particularly bad one day, probably everyone's gonna be a little bit more down, a little bit more depressed. And so you might be worried that, um, you know, this information is gonna be picking up on things like what the weather is like or what day of the week it is, rather than the stuff we're actually interested in, like how much income you have or uh, other factors about your life. But uh, social psychologists and economists have gotten pretty good at noticing these trends in effect and have been able to like, develop ever more sophisticated methodologies for correcting for them. So most of the information that we have is, is designed specifically to correct for these worries. Um, another maybe slightly more philosophical worry you might have is that uh, happiness is just like too subjective of an idea. It's really hard to, to compare different people's uh, ideas of happiness. So, you know, like, what's happiness to me is not happiness for someone else, so how can we generalize in the way that we would have to for this research? 
Um, well, there's a, you know, a few considerations you could say against this worry, but probably the, the most striking one is the fact that people are really, really good uh, with relatively little information at predicting how happy or unhappy other people are. So in one study, uh, individuals were given a very brief background biography on someone and, a two, and conducted a two minute interview with them. Um, and over this, uh, this study, people were uh, incredibly uh, accurate at predicting how, how happy people self-reported. So um, within about a 5% margin of error, they could guess on a 10 point scale um, how unhappy or happy they were. And so it turns out that actually we're fairly good at understanding each other. We're fairly good at understanding what makes us happy and what makes uh, other people happy in, the, in these very brief interviews. So it seems that while happiness can be subjective in some sense, it seems that it's comparable in a way that's kind of intuitive to us. Another worry uh, that you might have is that as I'm going through all this information about things that uh, you know, make us happy or make us unhappy, I'm gonna be talking about averages. So when you know, economists say things like, uh, the Danes are the happiest people on earth, um, or that happiness kind of dips during middle age, uh, and then goes up as you get grayer. They're of course, of course not talking about any particular individual or pair of individuals, they're talking about trends. Um, so you might be worried, you know, what about this eccentric special individual? What about you? <laughs> what does all of this have, have to do with you if we're talking about averages? Well, uh, in general, values like this are near the mean or more likely, so things are, these sort of things are normally distributed. Um, so we should expect that the, the average, we're more likely to embody the average trends than be an outlier. Uh, and people tend to overestimate their own uniqueness in kind of really interesting ways. So one study um, by Kulig and colleagues showed that people actually overestimated the uniqueness of their own first name. So they thought their first name was more uncommon than it actually was. Um, but nonetheless, I do concede that individuals do vary in tastes. Um, people do have very different relationships to money. Some people just have um, much more expensive tastes than others. And so obviously all the information that I'm giving in this presentation has to be curtailed a bit to your own taste and your own lifestyle. But there's one thing that I want you to keep in mind uh, as a major caveat around all that, uh, which is that we are very bad, incredibly bad at predicting our own happiness. And we tend to think we're really good at predicting our own happiness and what will make us happy. But time and time again, the evidence shows that we're just really, really rubbish at it. So there's a really rich and uh, interesting literature uh, called effective forecasting, which is essentially just a fancy word meaning people predicting, making guesses about uh, whether or not an event will make them happy or unhappy in the future. So you say something like um, predict what, what your life is going to be like if you win the lottery or what your life is going to be like if you break a leg and people make sort of best guesses uh, on, the, on the sort of assumptions about how their life is going to go. Um, and it turns out that these are systematically uh, mistaken. So people tend to estimate that if they win the lottery, the life will become massively, massively better and like, they'll be like twice as happy as they normally are. Uh, and in fact, in most cases, about six months after winning the lottery, people's lives are basically, in terms of self-reported happiness, more or less where they were uh, beforehand. And so uh, the reason that we see these sort of uh, miscasts between what we predict our future happiness to be uh, and what they actually turns out to be is, is due to a number of factors, but probably the two most prominent are the impact bias which is the fact that we systematically overestimate the impact that outcomes and life changes will have on our sense of happiness. Um, and one reason for this uh, is because we focus specifically on the things that uh, are gonna change in our lives rather than thinking about all the things in our lives that are gonna be the same. So they did a number of studies and showed that people just generally really overestimate life changes. So people tend to uh, underestimate the quality of life on patients on chronic dialysis. So when they're thinking about other people, they think chronic dialysis is much worse than it is. Um, people overestimate the negative impacts of dissolving a romantic relationship. Uh, and they tend to overestimate the negative impact of a favored candidate losing an election. Uh, this maybe is particularly pertinent as we all watch uh, in maybe a little bit major concern of the current uh, uh, American elections happening or going to happen in the future. Um, and it actually turns out to work with money as well, which is of course important for what we're talking about. Um, so this is one study that showed that work, when working women were asked to estimate the proportion of time spent in a bad mood by those in low income, they made predictions that were, quote, grossly exaggerated compared to the reality. This was a study by Kahneman and colleagues. And a similar study found that a representative sample of Americans vastly underestimated the happiness of people earning lower levels of household income. So this is 55,000 US dollars and below. So you see there's just this really, oh, oh, wrong button. There's this really big uh, gap between sort of like what people are predicting how bad it is and how, how people actually experience it. So all of this is just as a big flag, don't let the impact bias fool you. When you're thinking about the effects of how you're gonna spend your money in the future, you're gonna be you know, really caught up in these sorts of uh, illusions. Um, there are certain things we can do to correct this. 
So one thing we can do is try to avoid the focusing illusion. So as, as, we, as I said before, one of the reasons why these sort of surprising results come up is because people focus specifically on the ways in which their life's gonna be different rather than thinking about all the life, way their lives are gonna be the same. You know, if you win the lottery, you're still gonna have uh, most the same, uh, you know, personal relationships and other things. The most, the most meaningful things in your life are gonna remain the same. Um, and the other major thing to consider is to, uh, we should, that we should remember to account for psychological adaptation. So human beings are in fact uh, incredibly capable of adjusting to new circumstances. There are some things that we don't really adjust very, very well to. One of the weird ones is actually traffic sound. So it turns out that no matter what level of exposure you have to traffic sound, it always kind of like bumps down your life satisfaction. But even really quite dramatic life events, we can kind of rise back up and be just as happy as we were before. So when you're thinking about things like giving away money, really keep these two things in mind. But of course, we want to move away from just thinking, using our intuitions and predicting sort of based on our best guesses what our future life is going to be like when we make big financial decisions like this. Uh, ideally, we'd have some data to look at. So I'm going to move uh, to that now. So economists have taken up the age old question, can money buy us happiness? Uh, and they've come up with a series of answers. Um, and I say answers plural because it actually really depends on what you mean by this question. Uh, so one potential uh, question you could be asking is, do nations uh, generally get happier as they get wealthier? And the answer to that uh, question seems to be, at least potentially, is no. So in a really famous study by uh, Richard Easterlin, he found that there was absolutely no upward trend uh, in the USA between, since the 1950s uh, in overall happiness, despite a doubling of real GDP uh, over that time period. Uh, and he argued that we can actually see a, a similar trend uh, in Japan um, which had a five times, uh, five-fold increase in GDP uh, between 1958 and 1987. So this is really sort of surprising conclusion that despite the fact that people are, at least in Japan's case, five times richer than they were, um, they're basically just as happy um, as they were um, when they had five times less. That's the Japanese study. But this is not exactly the question that we want. We, what we're really interested in is, what's the effect going to be on my individual life within an, within an economy? We're not that interested about what the entire economy, uh, what everyone in the economy's happiness is going to do. And to get this better sense of this, what we need to look at is uh, cross-sectional surveys. So we need to look at um, you know, how different levels of income affect happiness for different people in the same sort of time in the same economy. Luckily, there's quite a bit of uh, a data on this. So we can look at. Uh, basically look at different people uh, as a cro in a cross-section of society, compare the people who have high incomes, the people who don't have high incomes, and ask, is, do we see an effect on happiness here? So then we can pose the question now, are the rich happier? And the answer is a resounding yes. So uh, cross-sectional studies show again and again that the richer you are, the more likely you are to report being very happy. So this is a quote from Easterlin. Uh, in every representative national survey ever done, a significant positive bivariant relationship between happiness and income has been found. So just to give a sense of how big this is, um, respondents indicating above average life satisfaction are 19% higher for high income groups in the UK and 17% higher globally for high income groups over low income groups. Um, and despite what you may have heard, there's actually no evidence of a cutoff point. So it's not like you hit 35,000 pounds and then your life doesn't really get any better in terms of your happiness. Uh, it turns out that this positive bivariant correlation that we see uh, continues to go up and up, and there's no uh, point of satiation. So you just keep getting richer and richer and happier and happier, I guess is the story here. So um, you might be a bit confused, and I think probably you should be, because this statement, the statement that money does make us happy, seems to be in direct contradiction to what we just saw about the fact that an entire nation can double in its income or, or you know, five-fold its income, and everyone's just as happy on average as they were before. So what explains this, this weird phenomena? Well, one potential explanation, I and mean, there's a couple, but probably one of the most prominent explanations, is that at some point in the development of technology and the improvement of quality of life, um, and all, all the crazy things our you know, phones can do, um, it stops being really about the actual technology and what the phone can do, and it starts being a bit more about how it compares to our neighbor's phone. So for better or for worse, human beings seem to be, at least this evidence seems to suggest that we're kind of slightly innately a hierarchical species. We care uh, where we fit in the pecking order and we care about our relationship to our neighbors. So satisfaction in this case depends much less on how you're doing in absolute terms and much more on how you're doing relative to your peers. So this is, and this effect is actually incredibly strong. So 
Um, Ball and Shranova in, in a study found that for the medium individual, the effects of a marginal change in relative income on happiness is several times larger than the effect of a marginal change in absolute income. And just to give you a sense of how big this is, um, for, that, for that median individual, so someone who's at like the 50% point in the total economy, uh, they should be indifferent in terms of their own happiness in, in a uh, tripling of their income, keeping their rank in the social order constant at 50%, uh, and simply moving from 50% to 70% uh, in, the, in the sort of social hierarchy and keeping their income constant. So basically, if they could just make the rest of society poorer, such that they were now in the 70th percentile rather than the 50th percentile, that would be just as good for them as if they actually just like tripled their income, but stayed, but the rest of society tripled its income as well. So this is kind of really very strange effect. All right, so I've been talking a lot about these kind of weird findings in economics and these sort of strange counterintuitive conclusions. How does it actually uh, affect the question that we're asking? Like, how would, it, how would it feel to give away 10%? Well, I think the information I've presented so far is enough to sketch a kind of worst case scenario. So if giving away 10% is like earning 10% less, and the difference felt will be like the difference in happiness between someone earning the same as us and someone earning 10% less, then I think we can sort of chart out this worst case scenario that our happiness will decrease. So if we give away something in 10%, we should expect our happiness to go down. And it's a bit of a disappointing result. Uh, it's always a bit unfortunate to think that, you know, what is good for the world, and, you know, that could save dozens of people's lives or deworm thousands of children, is maybe slightly bad for us. Uh, kind of a bummer. But notice that I said happiness decreases, but not by how much. So, uh, based on data from 46 countries, uh, a fall in income by one third, holding national income constant, causes a fall in happiness of two points on the scale of happiness from 10 to 100. So on a 90 point scale, a fall of one third of your income only hits you for two points. Um, so uh, one third is you know, obviously much larger than 10%. So you could, from, you know, extrapolating from that information, you could think that giving away 10% would be something like a fall in less than one point on a 90 point scale. So it's a very small change in our happiness. Just to give you a sense of the other things that affect our happiness and what we should be focusing on rather than money, it turns out that basically every other major factor of our life, including uh, our employment, our personal relationships, even our religious faith, and definitely our health, has a much bigger impact. So these are some numbers uh, on that same 90 point scale for different uh, situations. So there's the financial number I just mentioned, the two points for a fall of one third. Um, being divorced or separated or even never married has a much larger effect than that. Uh, your job being insecure has a much larger effect on that. Um, community and friends um, has a, roughly the same effect as this one-third drop. Um, subjective health being down by a one on a five-point scale, much larger. And indeed, religious belief actually is, seems to swamp this financial consideration as well. So money matters, but not as much as you think. Uh, and again, the, the assumptions we were spelling out earlier is just the worst case scenario. And things look much better than this if we, lack, if we relax those two assumptions I was talking about earlier. And we definitely should relax those assumptions because they're not really accurate. So the first reason why these assumptions aren't really accurate is because correlation is just not causation in this case. So even if giving away 10% is like taking a 10% pay cut, the difference in happiness that you would expect by simply following the correlation between income and happiness is likely to be exaggerated. And this is because there are a lot of factors that uh, affect both numbers at the same time. So for example, people who have a sunnier disposition, who are happier, who are generally more positive and energetic, are more likely to pursue high income careers and you know, not get laid off as often and generally be more successful. So the causation can actually work the other way, such that being happier means that you earn more. So it's not actually the earning that's doing the work here. Um, likewise, giving away 10% is just not at all the same thing as having never earned it. I mean, in order for that to be true, uh, it would have to be the same to you, to the person giving away that 10%, that you just like took all that money and went out in the street and like lit it on fire. Uh, as, as you know, that was just the same way of using that money as sending it uh, to help uh, dozens of people and really radically change people's lives. Chances are, if you're the person, kind of person who gives away a substantial fraction of their income to effective charities, you're doing it because you're living up to your values. You're doing it because you wanna help the world and make the world a better place. And that has real cachet when it comes down to our life satisfaction. So, um, you know, philosophers and, and economists have debated this point for a long time, but by now it's, uh, psychology has pretty much closed out the question of whether or not people find intrinsic satisfaction in helping others. And, and it turns out that they do. Um, you know, helping other people sparks these little um, sort of moments of, moments of pleasure, often called the warm glow effect. Um, 
you know, there's lots of sort of behavioral uh, science on this, but there's also lots of neuroscience. So it shows that the, uh, you know, in one study, they showed that the reward centers in the brain uh, were activated when participants chose to transfer money to a local food bank anonymously. So even though they weren't going to get any credit for it, they just felt good in the act of giving. Um, and actually, they sound, found similar reward centers being triggered when there was a mandatory transaction. So even when they didn't have a choice of whether or not to give the money to the food bank. Um, which a New York Times article sort of uh, interpreted as the fact that people might secretly enjoy paying their taxes. Um, so, yeah, so it seems that our psychologies like, um, are designed to really enjoy helping other people. We like the fact that we can help people make the world a better place, and that's going to have an effect on our happiness. So the important lesson here is that spending money on others just isn't at all like never having had that money in the first place. Spending money helping the world makes us feel good and, indeed, will have a real effect on our long-term happiness. So what we should really be looking at here is not the relationship between income and happiness, which there's much more data on, but we should, what we really should be looking at is the relationship between happiness and the way we spend our money. Because after all, that's what we're deciding on what to do. We're not deciding whether or not to earn less. We're going to be earning the same. We're deciding whether or not to spend that 10% on consumptive goods or maybe like a slightly larger apartment or whether to spend that money on helping people through the best charities available. And so that should be the, the sort of area we're focusing on. But the reason that I haven't been focusing on that area this whole time uh, is because the data here is just really limited. So uh, while economists have been really, really focused on this question of the relationship between income and happiness, they just strangely haven't been that focused on the question of the relationship between happiness and spending, which uh, is kind of bizarre when you think about it, because that's really the thing we have, in, in a way, the most control over. So there's a little bit, there's a growing literature on this. So there's, uh, I just want to really qu quickly bring up these eight principles um, from a uh, article by Dunn and colleagues. Um, that discuss ways that you can spend your money to make yourself more happy. So I really encourage you all to take a, take a look at this article. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and more importantly, it's very actionable. You know, it's something that these are ways that you can spend your money to uh, you know, make yourself more happy. But obviously, the principle that I'm most interested in for the course of this talk is principle number two, uh, the fact that um, helping others rather than helping yourself is a way of spending your money that actually makes you more happy. So it's not just that spending money on others makes us happy. Uh, that gives us intrinsic satisfaction, it actually gives us more intrinsic satisfaction than many of the other ways we spend our money. So this is a bit of a correlational data again from these cross-sectional surveys. Um, in almost all countries, there's a positive correlation between subjects' well-being and answering yes to the question, have you donated money to charity in the last month? And it's actually quite a strong relationship. So donating to charity has a similar relationship to subjective well-being as a doubling of household income. This is according to a study by Atkin. Of course, we should be a little bit worried about this for the same reasons I was outlining earlier. This is just correlational data. This doesn't actually show us that donating that money caused people to be happier, but at least seems to suggest there's a possible causal relationship here. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that gives us a little bit more evidence for thinking that there's not just a correlational, but a causal relationship between giving and happiness. So the study goes something like this. Uh, imagine you were given a small amount of money, something like 12 pounds, and you were told that you, could either, that you have to either spend it on yourself, so on personal consumption, so like a treat or paying off a bill, or spending it on someone else, either a friend or to a local food bank. Uh, and when individuals were given this assignment, which is a study done actually in Canada, um, most participants thought they'd be happier spending the money on themselves. But you're probably seeing where this is going by now. Uh, it turns out that they were wrong. Uh, in fact, subjects in the pro-social spending condition reported much greater life satisfaction, much greater happiness uh, as a consequence of spending money on other people. Um, just to give a little bit more uh, sort of correlational data, uh, in a longitudinal study of 16 employees at a Boston-based company who received a profit-sharing bonus, those who devoted more of their bonus to pro-social spending experienced greater happiness later on when they were, when they were uh, reviewed. Again, relatively small data set, relatively correlational, but again, I think it suggests uh, this relationship. So it turns out that um, you know, the relationship between giving and happiness is much different than I think our intuitions generally portray it as. We usually see money as both something that's incredibly important in our lives in terms of our own happiness and something that, uh, that you know, donating, donating money to charity isn't really a way of, of accessing the happiness that money can give. Uh, I hope that I've given you some information that, can, that will make you consider the fact that actually money is a lot less important for happiness than we think it, are, it is, and indeed one of the best ways of accessing the happiness money can give us is by giving it to other people. But of course, uh, I think most of us recognize that 
when we're considering whether or not to give a charity, it's not really about us. It's not really about our own life satisfaction. It's about ideally helping other people. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is any one of us, uh, even on an average salary uh, in the UK, by giving away 10% of our income, can save dozens of people's lives from malaria. We could deworm thousands, indeed tens of thousands of children from tropical diseases. And that's something that we could do, and indeed perhaps should do, even if it meant a cost to our own happiness. Um, so the real question is, why wouldn't we do something like that? I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't is because they're worried that it will have a real impact on their own life, their own well-being, and understandably, they're worried about how their life is going to go. So I hope that uh, the information I provided you on the relationship between giving and happiness gives you some consideration uh, against that worry, gives you some consideration in favor of giving uh, this 10% as part of the pledge. And indeed, I, I also think there's an additional anecdote that I can talk a bit about that was kind of framed at the beginning, which is the sort of experiences uh, and testimony of the now over 1,600 members of Giving What We Can. So as was mentioned, Giving What We Can is a international organization uh, with chapters all over the world, of uh, people who pledge to give 10% of their career income to the most cost-effective charities. Uh, and far from feeling like a burden uh, in, in the countless interactions I've had with our members, people who've signed up to Giving What We Can see it as a real opportunity to, not, to use their money for something that, is, that, has, that does a lot of good for the world, uh, to live up to their values and to like, feel like they're part of a, of, of a larger movement. And I think these things, at least in people's self-reports, have a really big cash in terms of their own happiness. Uh, and I think, so I think the, uh, this, this misnomer that we have that money uh, is incredibly important for our happiness and money spent on ourselves is the best way to spend money for our happiness uh, is a mistake. And I think that's sort of being revealed as we get more and more testimony from, from members giving what we can. So I hope in the process of this presentation, I've given you some good information and maybe made you consider a little bit more of the possibility of signing up yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't you ask giving what we can members whether they're happy? <laughs> That's a great question. So yeah, I guess so far we mostly have just like the anecdotes of me of like talking to people. But yeah, maybe we should do like a life satisfaction survey of all giving what we can members and see if we can see. Yeah, yeah, that could be quite a little bit more, a little bit more systematic. Yeah, we should definitely. You also know whether like because you want to like be essentially something where by sort of force people to sign the pledge. We'll see. Are they happier? I mean, yeah, I agree. I definitely, I'm a bit too deep, but I definitely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. You would also worry that there might sort of still be this correlational thing, right? Maybe the people who are attracted to giving what we can in the early days are just like more optimistic or something like that. So you're right. The, the best way to do it is just force a bunch of people to give away 10% of their income, although that still wouldn't quite be right. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, th that RCT hasn't been done yet. But when it is, we'll know, we'll know for sure. Um, um, is there any evidence about whether the type of charity people donate to makes a difference on how happy they are? Like, I'm wondering if these studies are based on people donating to like, local charities or something, and maybe donating in your community will make you happier than donating to a more kind of abstract charity, yeah, or maybe yeah. donating to an effective charity that you know is doing good will make you happier than donating. I don't know. I wonder if there's anything about that. Yeah, that's a great question. So as far as I know, I think the cross-sectional surveys don't dis differentiate between types of charity, at least not the numbers that I was citing. Um, my guess is that given common trends in charitable donations, most of the charitable donations that we're considering would be like within one's own country, because that's just sort of how it pans out in most places. Um, so yeah, I think that is, I think it's a great question. I think it'd be really interesting to see um, if there was like, if you could see this relationship, especially for the effectiveness bit, like if people giving to effectiveness, effective charities had more of a bump. But as far as I know, most of the numbers I was citing, they're all just charity at large rather than, they don't really break it down by local versus international or effective versus like less effective. Um, but it would be great to know, yeah, for sure. I've definitely read that um, if a charity tells you like, what your donation's done, mm. that makes people a lot happier. Yeah. So they're like, accountability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. I mean, my guess would be like, the, 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 more, the more people like, think about it and like, see the direct impact of their action, the more that they get the sort of like, positive bump that we're, the sort of the psychological mechanism that makes us happy for, for giving, yeah. Are there any surveys on um, uh, lifestyle changes, uh, lifestyle? Oh, like how, how happy it makes them to like not have malaria. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. So yeah, actually that's so, I mean, I know, I know the, um, the, so the disease control priorities project that looks at years of healthy life, these sort of the DALI or quality measurements um, would be the closest thing I could think of, but I'm not, you can't like, you can't do a direct line between 
uh, you know, the sort of health, health measures and happiness. But you could probably do a pretty straightforward translation from the considerations I saw before. Obviously, you know, being down one point on a five point scale of subjective happiness is this huge, huge hit on that scale we saw earlier. So uh, if things like malaria or schistosomiasis are in that category, which I imagine at least malaria would be, um, we could make a pretty safe inference that, you know, there'd be like this huge trade off. Um, yeah. Probably if you're dead, you're not happy. So oh yeah, that too, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Well, that's not true, what's the zero anyway? But, <laughs> <laughs> what's the zero point? Um, actually, one question I'm going to ask is, um, my understanding is, although there's like no threshold in terms of like, income or happiness, it's also like a leveling up effect, so it's all like increased, like, basically, well, logarithmically or sub-logarithmically, so you might infer, therefore, even like, if you're giving people money in the developing world, but obviously the because you're like on the flat bit of the curve and they are, you match hopefully like, be like net positive in terms of making happiness more happy. No. Yeah, <laughs> making more people happy. No, I think that, yeah, that sounds exactly right to me. Like, even though there's not this, this clear satiation point, I'd be very surprised if there wasn't this sort of, like, at least some kind of leveling off. Because, yeah, most of the, you know, once you're on the sort of upper echelons of society, you know, you're kind of already there. That extra 100,000 pounds is probably not, like, doing all that much for you in terms of, like, your day-to-day -day or, like, even your status, which are, like, the main mechanisms that would cause happiness. So, yeah, you're much better off just like, giving that to someone who's, like, in the worst situation, yeah. So there's like some things you were quoting that it's more your relative uh, income that affects your happiness. Is that true even when you're in absolute poverty, like when you don't have enough money to buy food or basic yeah, my guess is that probably not. Like, I so I actually can't. I can't remember what the those cross-sectional surveys were saying about like at the very bottom. But my sense is that you know, although actually it, it may it may very well you know you know given the the most plausible I think explanation for how you can have these. The sort of the cross-sectional information and the the flat uh, happiness curve for no matter how much your your total economy grows, um, this this sort of explanation that it's like a comparative thing that like in fact maybe even within like very poor communities being slightly better off than like your slightly worse off neighbors or having like so certain signals that like that you have you're slightly better off might actually still have a yeah might still quite quite create this bump um, I, that would I would guess but I imagine it's probably like a lot it's probably overshadowed by all of the you know health and other problems that one has in one's life. Yeah. So globalization is probably really bad when because people realize how poor they are. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, like so like, you know, you watch, you know, if you're like in a really not, you know, a developing uh, economic context and you see like MTV's Cribs, is that just like ruining your life? Because uh, you're always going to be looking at your, your house and being like, oh, it's not, you know, it doesn't have 10 swimming pools. So I don't know. Yeah, it's a really good question because I, I don't know how, I don't know how, yeah, how big that effect goes or how it extrapolates to like, yeah, seeing something on TV rather than seeing it in your actual like day to day community. Like that's a very very interesting question. Also, we all gave ten percent, and we'd be no less happy at all. <laughs> <laughs> or we'd all just level down, and then yeah, no cost at all. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Uh, I was going to ask this comparative thing: is it, is it applied between countries as well? So like, yeah. Japan uh, didn't get any happier, but did it keep its rank? Yeah, so I think I think it's more on an individual level is my sense. Although again, this this question of like, do you like watching the TV and seeing yeah. wealth, like extravagant wealth in another country, does it affect you? I, I it's definitely like an open question. I think the, so. The numbers we were looking at were definitely were all cross-sectional surveys within a particular country. So we don't really have. I don't. I it, I can't extrapolate directly from that to like conclusion on that other question. But it would be really interesting to think about. Yeah, how that would affect. I'm pretty sure Japan's rank would have increased in that time period because it had massive economic. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, yeah. No, so actually, yeah. In the, on the world stage, you're absolutely right. Yeah, they would have jumped up. So the fact that we didn't see an overall increase, I guess, suggests that that's not the case. It's sort of graph that shows that with, between countries, that it's the inequality, that it's the most equal countries that are the happiest. And then it goes down with hmm. more inequality. So I guess it might depend how that changes. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Any reason you can think of why something of a pledge would make you less happy? Um, yeah, I mean, there's like, I guess in like sort of more dramatic life circumstances, I can imagine like, yeah, you could be like in a very stressful situation that might push you, push you in, a, in a bad spot. But I think for the vast majority of people who don't experience like, you know, the very, the very hard, harshest, um, yeah, poverty within this country, I think you'd, you basically, based on this data, you wouldn't expect to see much of a negative impact. I mean... Um, especially like if you're anywhere in the median case, that would be my, my, my suspicion, yeah. Corollary to that question is, could it ever be plausible that below people, so there's obviously a famous statistic, um, a lot of us use when doing talks like this, about, you know, like 
But bottom one percent of people in the US are still like richer than like two percent of people in India, for example. <laughs> the import really matters sort of like relative relative income rather than absolute income. Actually, many people who are the bottom one percent of the US are like objective or objective, but in like a worse situation subject to the than even people are living or groups of us all protest poverty in other parts of the world. If relative if it's relative the thing matters so much. So so maybe yeah. people are worse off actually are uh, maybe not more logical, but actually the people right at the bottom of the compile. Okay. Yeah, it might be. Although, again, I think looking at the sort of other numbers, the sort of the, the things that seem to dominate income considerations, which are these relative things, are things like health and other considerations. So, um, you know, even with that fall by one third, which would be the sort of, yeah, positional fall by one third is only a couple of points on the happiness scale, whereas anything to do with substantial subjective health uh, feelings is like six or eight points. So I think in any place where you know, you, where the trade-offs are like, like substantial health things like malnutrition or malaria or something like that, you're probably still, you know, it's, you're probably still objectively better off even if you're at the bottom of like a well-off society. But then, yeah, there might be like counterintuitive sort of median cases where, yeah, someone who's like in the middle group in India who has like objectively less money is like better off than the very bottom of, of, of like, say, the U.S. economy, yeah. Wasn't the health statistic about how people rated their own health yeah, so, so that, that, would, that would like change depending on like where you were in a, in a country. Like you might rate your health as worse if you were the poorest in America than if, than you would if you actually had objectively worse health as a someone in a poorer country. Yeah, absolutely. So like that that one study was looking at people's like subjective ranking of their own health, but there's like there's other qualitative studies that show that like people's actual like actual health affects things as well. So like if you have malaria, that does have effects even if you don't perceive malaria as like weird for your society. Like even if lots of people have Malaria. So I think the, but although probably there is there is an effect of like yeah how you perceive it. Uh, just going back to Adam's question about um, uh, yeah about whether it's good, uh, it could be bad like, I guess on this on the presentation you had to start about um, divorce being worse than being single mm -hmm. throughout your life. So if, if, you, <laughs> if you make taking the pledge getting married and divorce and not sticking to the pledge, then what is that might be relevant is how many people take the pledge stick with it because if lots of people take it then don't. This the uh, yeah so I'd be a little bit wary about like making that analogy so strong because I mean I mean obviously the things that are at play psychologically in the case of marriage and divorce is much different than at the pledge but um, in terms of retention rates yeah I mean like uh, still like th thus far it seems like I mean we only have like five years of data to go by but we're still looking quite good in terms of like the vast majority you know I think that our current drop off rate something like one and a half percent a year or something like that, which is like much better than we'd originally thought it would be. And so we're quite happy thus far, but we're, it's also very hard to extrapolate too much because you know, most of the data points that we have more than like, you know, like three years ago, we had you know, only a couple hundred members, whereas now we have 1600. So most of our data is relatively young. So we can't like really come out and be like, definitely for sure forever. But um, again, I think the case of Stopping the pledge in the future is probably not going to be anything like uh, divorce in terms of <laughs> effects on happiness. Yeah. So, uh, so you had like this, initially you had this like, comparison between incomes and your spending. Mm -hmm. Is there ever, I'm guessing there aren't many, but a study on like, taking a pay cut would presumably be the best in that? Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good, um, that's a good question. I mean, I guess. The most of the most of the studies in terms of like losing income presume a sort of like a case like this where you're either laid off or you have to work less hours or something like that. So when they say a drop, yeah, yeah, like a drop, a drop in one third, like some unexpected expense causes your income to like suddenly drop unexpectedly. Yeah, these are the sort of cases I think that they're that they're sort of extrapolating from. So, um, the, yeah, that's the general thought is that it's like a sort of unexpected like you were at this level now you've dropped down to that level. Um, yeah. So your kind of hypothesis for why having more money would make people happier is effectively when it comes down to status. Mm. I'm just wondering if there's any way we can make like giving money away be a status symbol. Because it feels like that would really solve the problem and encourage a lot of people to get special hats. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> T-shirts that people could wear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We should create some organization that try to get lots of social signaling or something, yeah. Um, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think in a, in a small way, Giving Away Can's kind of trying to do that in the sense of just trying to be a, like, a way of signaling it and a way of being like, kind of happy with that fact. It's kind of already happening with other sort of figures as well. Like, I think the Bill and the Gates Foundation and like, 
these these sorts of uh, organizations really do a good job at like seeing it as like a noble thing to do, although it's still a bit controversial. And I guess like the, the sort of Mark Zuckerberg's recent thing as well. So hopefully is that, like, you know, if, if giving became fashionable, then maybe that then is a thing that can replace some of the social signaling. But I think, I think it's just very difficult because yeah, there's a lot of, you know, making something seem like the thing to do that gives you social status is just like a, I don't know how you go about making that happen. You know, you have to be, I think like there's a lot of industries that spend a lot of money trying to figure that out and it's not clear, yeah. I always hear about how to about thinking of things in that way because presumably those who are higher up in the um, social status are kind of reflected by a more negative feeling than those lower down. So uh, I don't know, is that the my so so if you if you're higher up in the social status and that leads to more happiness, presumably people lower down that leads to more unhappiness. I'm kinda of talking about just give their money away. No, I see. Yeah. So the worry is that status is always zero sum, which it seems like yeah. it, that seems to be that seems to be borne out by this data. Right. If all of if the whole like if all of society's happiness is staying flat, but there is a difference for income, it means that like, you know, my income gain for status is someone else's like, sorry, my happiness gain for status might be someone else's happiness loss. I don't I'm not I'm actually not as familiar about what the trade-offs are there. But yeah, insofar as it's zero sum, it's probably better to abolish all status in society, although that might be a bit uh, far in the future as well. Yeah. But like, yeah. If, if it's going to be a zero sum competition anyway, it's better people can beat about how much money they give away than the US <laughs> yeah. part. I guess I can agree with that, yeah. I think it's easier to replace status than like abolish it altogether. Right, yeah, it's probably true. People would change the spike figuration today. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs>